Hey, I'm Kat Lowe. I'm content moderation lead and user experience researcher at Medan. And I work with fact checkers to help build software that makes their work um, as smooth and sustainable as possible. Uh, for the past decade, I've been doing research on mental health and burnout for people uh, doing online work. So that's community moderators, uh, managers, content moderators, and journalists. I also work with crisis organizations uh, to write guides to help online influencers, journalists, and women in male-dominated industries manage online harassment. I'm currently applying those insights um, to fact-checking and what fact-checkers have to go through. So in particular, today I'm going to be talking about mental health and fact-checking um, because a lot of journalists and fact-checkers don't really take mental health seriously, um, or at least the field doesn't, uh, because it doesn't seem really obvious what the impacts are. Uh, people think that they can handle it on a personal level um, or it just, yeah, it doesn't really seem concrete. So burnout, it turns out, is super common, um, very real, and what actually leads to lasting mental health effects is very hard to detect and very hard to keep track of. I don't think enough people take this head on, and so and what ends up happening is mental health issues and stress end up creeping in. And the point I really want to drive home is that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Just doing things day to day to keep track of your mental health um, can help you prevent really significant impacts on your mental health in the long run. Uh, this is especially important during COVID right now, so we'll also be discussing challenges specific to COVID. So I think talking about mental health and building a common vocabulary around mental health and sharing our experiences are really key for preserving your own health, but they're very seldom articulated and very rarely focused on in professional spaces. So for part one, we'll be mapping out mental health and fact-checking. So what are the risks to mental health in journalism and fact-checking? How can we understand trauma from doing that kind of work? And how do we grapple with attitudes towards trauma and fact-checking? Uh, the second part um, is safe solutions for fact-checking. I want to go the step of exploring solutions in a way that are actionable, especially when you feel like you have more pressing things that need doing or you just don't have the willpower or the energy. Um, it's, it's very easy to overlook or dismiss measures to preserve your mental health um, because they don't have that material impact a lot of the time. So we'll be talking about managing online safety and harassment, um, mitigating and managing what we call vicarious trauma or secondary traumatic stress, and what good resources are and, and how to get support. So starting out, mapping out mental health and fact-checking. What are the major challenges that you face in managing your mental health? Um, I want to start out with a content warning. So we'll be focusing a lot of the time on talking about trauma and the emotional stress that can come with doing this work. So um, we'll be have there will be some references to witnessing disturbing content and working with victims of violence. There will not be any images and no graphic descriptions. So this is actually an interactive session. Um, these topics and just going through them can be kind of grueling. So I think it's important to get involved, self-reflect and engage with your peers doing this work. So go to the document linked in this presentation. Um, and this document is where you will fill in your own experiences and thoughts. Um, you, the document has all the resources that I talk about in this presentation with some extra guidance around security. So, you know, copy that for your own uh, benefit. Um, but right now, basically we're doing a warm up and check in. So in the bullet points below in the first activity, just write out like how you're feeling, something that you're grateful for today and something that you're working on that you're excited about, or just one of the three if you want. So now I wanna talk about common challenges to mental health. While we'll mostly be talking about trauma, there are a lot of sources of stress that can compound and make any emotional stress that you're going through even worse. So I've categorized them into these themes occupational demand, professional and organizational precarity, emotional demand and moral injury, safety and harassment, and trauma. So what do I mean by these themes? The first is occupational demand, and that's like long hours, pressure to be productive and be competitive, an expectation to be on demand all the time for the latest misinfo or current event, uh, it being really difficult to enforce work-life separation, and the general invisibility of your work. The amount of investigation that you do will never be quite understood by the public. 
The next is professional and organizational precarity. A lot of people in this space have to do freelance work. Um, there's a lot of short-term contracts or it's unevenly distributed throughout the year for people uh, and sometimes a scarcity of jobs. And so that causes a lot of people to feel precarious professionally um, and in their careers. And media and human rights orgs often have limited funding and resources. And so that stress kind of trickles down to other people at the company. And then we have emotional demand. Uh, a lot of people have a sense of moral responsibility doing this work. Uh, there is an urgency of um, work having significant outcomes and implications. There is concerns about making a mistake and the emotional burden of, of thinking of the outcomes of that. You can often empathize with the subjects of your coverage and feel like you want to do more. And you often have to emotionally support your colleagues without training or preparation or even boundaries. And finally, there's moral injury, which I'll talk about in a second. And then there's harassment and safety. So you can often get harassment and hate um, invading your social media accounts, especially if you're publishing on something that's controversial. Um, and that can also lead to a violation of privacy through your online accounts. Uh, you also can experience threats to your personal safety and experience surveillance, whether it's through bad actors um, you know, independently, or it could be also a government actor. Moral injury is emotional distress or PTSD like symptoms that people can experience as a result of witnessing and feeling responsibility for acts that violate their moral beliefs, um, things that they did not or could not intervene in. A common example for moral injury is when a doctor knows what to prescribe a patient, but they can't because of an insurance issue. And so therefore they have to watch their patient suffer. And while they aren't technically responsible, they do feel guilt for not being able to intervene. Journalists and doctors are exposed to so much more human suffering these days because of COVID. So moral injury is becoming an increasing source of trauma. Trauma is a painful, disturbing experience that comes from abuse, deprivation, violence, and other violations of one's needs and human rights. People commonly think of it as a significant and sometimes singular event that is physical and must be in real life. But trauma is not just a result of direct or physical violence. It can actually happen through witnessing violence, through online experiences, and through many smaller repeated traumatizing events over a long period of time. There's a kind of trauma called vicarious trauma or secondary traumatic stress. These terms aren't entirely the same, but are often used interchangeably. And they're usually used to refer to emotional distress, often resembling symptoms of PTSD, incurred from working with victims of trauma, witnessing violence and human suffering, uh, or working on engaging in issues related to trauma and human suffering. So you can get secondary trauma from a single event, but it typically happens as a result of extended exposure. And this means that it often flies under the radar as a cause of distress. I'll be using the term secondary trauma to encapsulate this concept for simplicity. There is some evidence that most people are experiencing a form of secondary trauma from increasing graphic depictions of violence and human suffering on social media and in the news. And journalists and fact checkers have it worse because you're being exposed to it much more regularly and having to think about it all the time. So to articulate the diversity of sources of trauma for journalists and fact checkers, I've categorized some common sources from doing this work into themes. The first two kind of fall under the more common conception of trauma happening from direct action to you, where you may be experiencing direct threats to your safety online or in person. Um, you may also have experiences of being taken advantage of or being mistreated by people in your professional community, um, even in your own organization, especially where you haven't felt comfortable speaking out about it. The rest are typically thought of as indirect, where you are witnessing or interacting with depictions or victims of violence and suffering but they are still sources of trauma. So that's witnessing graphic and disturbing imagery, covering and being immersed in media and information about political, societal conflict and human suffering, interviewing or talking to victims of violence and suffering, personal traumatic experiences overlapping with subject of work. So in this case, reporting on COVID when your family member has died of COVID or your family's currently affected, uh, covering immigration or protests when your friends or personal community have been detained or harmed. And then you have extended and continuous exposure to work of this nature without 
significant mental and emotional breaks. And this is especially true with COVID because your home and your home computer is for many of you, the same place you're seeing distressing things. So you're constantly in the same environment where you're doing this work, whether you are resting, watching a movie, um, eating, it is often in the same place for many people right now. You also have the issue of staying at home and not being physically around coworkers. So you can't build rapport or support each other as directly where most of your interactions are just about the work at hand. And then finally, there's moral injury. While you aren't in a position to diagnose yourself, it is important to be self-reflective and aware of your own emotional state so that you know when you're in a bad place and when you really need to get help. Because you can have a lot of these symptoms and not register that this is happening to you or happening as a result of secondary trauma. So I'm not gonna go through all of them, but you know, it can be apathy, it can be just being tired all the time, blaming yourself. Um, a big one is intrusive thoughts, even when you're not working. Um, you know, it can have effects on your relationships with your family and friends. You can feel emotionally numb. Um, you can just be more anxious all the time or even have reduced compassion for other people. When we interviewed one of uh, our fact checking partners, they said, I go back home and I just think about these. Sometimes you want that choice not to look at distressing content. There are days when you feel low because of it. I wish we had a choice, but it is part of the job of a fact checker. Time and time again, I've been told by fact checkers and journalists that they didn't know they could get trauma or that mental health isn't taken very seriously by their peers. Failing to handle and being entirely dismissive of mental health risks in the field is very common, and it really has made a lot of people dealing with trauma even more isolated. So there are two major issues, awareness and legitimacy. So with awareness, I remember asking some fact checkers about if they had any major challenges that came to mind, especially mentally or emotionally distressing content, and they didn't really mention anything. Only later when I was talking specifically about secondary trauma, um, did somebody say, oh yeah, and sometimes I can't get images out of my head for some days or more. And they did not realize that what they were experiencing was PTSD. So vocabulary is actually very important for being able to name what's happening to you. And that vocabulary isn't really known in this space. Neither is the extent of the symptoms and the impact, um, the vectors of harm, basically like what can actually cause trauma, how it actually applies to the work that you're doing, that even if you're not looking at images, being immersed in the news cycles about it is still contributing to trauma. Professional training around how to mitigate trauma in yourself or in others is also not really well known and education in organizational support for people doing this work isn't really known either. There are also some regional challenges. In many places, trauma hasn't really expanded beyond the sort of physical abuse definition and therefore secondary trauma isn't really recognized yet. And then there's issues with legitimizing mental health issues in this space. In the same conversation I had with those fact checkers before, um, when somebody did say that they were having issues, another person kind of laughed and they said, well, uh, you just have to grow a thick skin uh, or, you know, it can't be helped. You kind of have to look at it anyway. So what's the point in sort of dwelling on it? So even when people do express or do recognize when they're dealing with mental health issues, they can kind of be silenced or pressured into not pursuing it or not saying anything. In many cases, it's seen as a personal issue rather than a medical issue. So it's something that you have to handle in your own time. Even when there is some awareness of mental health issues, there's often unwillingness to dedicate time and resources to support it. Um, there's also the expectation that you take it on yourself and that you don't bring your peers in, um, at least your professional peers in to help you. And there's also a sense of machismo or being able to take it. So a lot of people think of it as a sign of weakness or thinking that you're not fit to do the work if you're affected by it, uh, especially when you compare yourself to more senior colleagues, many of whom seem to shrug it off because there hasn't been a lot of awareness. So people have kind of had to adjust or often burn out. I think it's very common to sort of think that you're not affected by this, um, you know, or that you've already grown a thick skin, um, but it can sort of happen over time as well. In the same interview we had with one of our fact-checking partners, they said, For the longest time, I thought I was immune to violent and graphic content and did not get impacted. But there are days when we have to look at gory images, blood, violence all day. I think, why is there so much hatred and violence? 
there are really distressing videos where you see people thrash each other. So that's kind of the state of the field right now, but for fact-checking and journalistic work to be sustainable and to actually be humane towards people doing this work, measures to not just acknowledge but take real action to preserve the mental health of people in this field should be an industry standard. And that's something we need to collectively acknowledge and expect from organizations and leaders in journalism. It can be really hard to do on your own, so that's why peer support is important. Um, enrolling other organizations and educating yours and spreading the expectation that this should be a baseline standard. So I think it's important to discuss these mental health challenges with your peers, uh, share this document, reflect on it if you can, and share the resources at the bottom of the document. And I really encourage you to use them yourself.